I think the wrong combinations potentially can also make certain foods less beneficial. One example I've heard you talk about before is what happens when you put milk into tea? I know you're a big fan of tea. On the last conversation, you spoke about a lot of the benefits of tea. But I think I've heard you say that if you add milk to your tea, that actually you reduce some of the beneficial effects. Is that right? You know, those scientists that do television shows to actually uh, make science accessible to people. This is kind of where we need to go with this, this topic. So look, tea green tea uh, especially has a natural polyphenol that's called catechins, EGCG, uh, uh, epigallocatechin gallate, uh, EGCG. And the, catech and the catechin is actually just part of the natural substance in the tea leaf. So whether you're um, brewing tea with a bag or whether it's loose leaf tea or whether it's matcha, which is just powdered tea leaves, um, the fact of the matter is that into the brew, into the liquid, the hot liquid, uh, comes all these phytochemicals, including these catechins. So when you sip straight tea, the catechins go right in. They're easily absorbed uh, by your body. And so, you know, your, our blood levels of catechins go way up. So many things that catechins can do. One of the things that's important is that actually it's, it's a relaxant. It actually helps lower your stress. It lowers the catecholamines. And so uh, other things, it helps your lipids. It actually also helps fight cancer. It's anti-inflammatory, kind of like curcumin. It's, it's a substance that has so many beneficial things that at least when I drink tea, I want, I want to get as much as I can out of my food. All right. Now, I, res I deeply respect traditions of, yeah, of eating and drinking. And one of the things that um, you know, I know is a tradition in England is you know, you put, or in Ireland, you actually put some milk or cream into your tea. It actually um, changes the flavor profile uh, and, and it's lovely. I, I, you know, I've, I've had plenty of teas in England before and, and I, I, I find it to be just such an uh, incredibly um, uh, uh, nice, I feel great, you know, sort of like having uh, an English uh, tea. Put dairy in it. Here's what you need to know: dairy, and I'm talking about cow dairy, right? So not 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 milk. This is applies to cow dairy. We'll come back to the nut milk in a second. Cow dairy, okay, actually is fat. Milk has got fat in it, like butter, which is made out of milk, and um, and the fat when you put it into your tea does change its flavor, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fact that when milk or cream is put into tea, the fat molecules in the cow dairy form little soap bubbles. These are microscopic soap bubbles. They're called micelles. Fat likes to stick with fat. And so um, tea is mostly water. And so when you pour milk into tea, the, the bubbles, the, the dairy fat sticks together and a little makes a little tiny soap bubble. And what does it do? Those soap bubbles trap the polyphenols from tea. It traps the catechin. So you've got some good stuff wrapped in a soap bubble of, of dairy. And now when you drink the tea, the catechin is trapped in the soap bubble. It doesn't get absorbed as easily in your stomach. And it just rolls down your gut. And a lot of it comes out the other end. Okay. And so you're missing out on a lot of the good stuff. You get a great, you know, you get a nice flavor. And so I have, you know, what I'm telling you is that if you're drinking uh, milk, uh, or, or cow milk, dairy, put it in your tea. You're, you're getting the you're getting good flavor if you if that's what you like, but you're missing out on all as as most of the uh, polyphenols. So just be aware that that's what you're actually doing. Now, if you want to actually still cut the tea with something that is uh, milk like, nut milks are fine because they don't actually have the same fatty reaction that the wow. dairy cow dairy has. So almond milk, uh, cashew milk, um, uh, those those soy milks, they're all fine. I mean, that's really interesting. And I like the way you frame it with this deep respect for cultures and traditions. Because I hear that and I think for someone who might be listening or watching this and they think, yeah, but you know what? It's just a part, part of what I do. Like I, I love putting milk in my black tea or I know some people even put it in their green tea, which I certainly haven't tried before. They might hear that and they may not want to change what they do. But is this where potentially supplements could come in. Let's say someone, they like the taste of milky tea, but they hear that and think, well, I want all those benefits of those polyphenols and the catechins that Dr. Lee was talking about. Maybe I can boost that another way by taking a supplement. 
Is there any merit to that way of thinking? And I guess you could expand that broadly into what is your view of, you know, supplements as a whole huge category, but there are some really good quality supplements out there. Perhaps you could speak to those issues a little bit, please. Yeah. Well, let's let's pick up the thread on tea for a second because I, I had this discovery that might be uh, useful for your listeners who are in exactly that situation where they like the taste of milk in their tea. I discovered there is something called milk tea and it's actually from Taiwan. It's grown in the mountain and it actually, it's, it's just pure tea leaves that when you brew it, it tastes like it's got dairy in it. Oh, wow. It's quite, it's quite amazing. I mean, if, if I made a cup of that for you and then made a cup of, of, of English tea with milk in it, you would have a hard time telling the difference. It's quite remarkable. Milk tea. It's a kind of, I think it's an oolong style tea. So it's yeah. uh, mildly fermented and still got green properties. It's got polyphenols in it, but it literally, it has to do with the way, the climate, the the way that it's naturally grown and the type of tea it is. So, all right, so let's move that aside for a second. Um, uh, um, all right, well, so what about supplements? You know, I, I think that we should look to the word itself. A dietary supplement means something to top off. So I always tell people, you know, if you have a choice of getting it from the whole food, the whole food will tend to have a lot of other stuff that's good for you. If you eat whole plant-based foods, for example, you get the fiber, you get the polyphenols, you get a lot of other chemical substances, you get the natural peptides uh, that are found in foods. That if you got a pure supplement, you might get the one molecule or two molecules that it's been created for, like a vitamin C supplement. Mm. Um, if you want to top off your vitamin C, it's pure vitamin C. You're going to get a lot of it if you if you take your take a, a vitamin. But you know, if you had citrus, you're going to get all that flavor. You're going to get the a different kind of flavor. You're going to you get some. Uh, you do get sugar. You get fiber. You get the limonene and the, and all these other uh, hesperidin, all these other bioactives that you can't get from yeah. a regular supplement alone. That said, you are absolutely right. Supplements can be really important, particularly uh, for people who have difficulty getting a lot of, 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 uh, of some nutrients or their food. So for example, um, I think omega-3 fatty acids are a great supplement if you get a high quality omega-3. Not everybody eats oily fish, you know, day in, you know, two to three times a week. You know, you only need to eat um, the amount in each serving with the size of a deck of playing cards. So you don't need to eat very much, but you know, that's not something people, most people do. People who live on the on the coastline, they might be doing it, but many people don't. Um, so omega-3s are so important to our health. I mean, this has been shown time and time and again. That's a supplement that's that's definitely worth taking. And, and, and it's a lot easier to swallow um, omega-3s than it is to actually to go to your fishmonger and then to look at what the catch of the day is. That's an example. Another example of a supplement I think is really worth, worth taking um, is probably vitamin D3, yeah. okay? Vitamin D, uh, you know, for, for those of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere, where we don't have as much sun uh, all the time, all year round, and where it's cold, so we're indoors a lot and not always outdoors under the sunshine. So I'm not talking Costa del Sol. I'm not talking about South Africa, you know, or Australia. I'm talking about, you know, England, Northern Europe, North America, you know, and sort of the Northeastern side. Okay. We don't get as much sunlight. And even if we do go outside, because it's cold, we wear a lot of clothes. And so our skin tends to be covered up. And so vitamin D is made by our skin when sunlight actually hits it. And so we don't, we tend to be vitamin D deficient. So here's an example of where you can eat foods like mushrooms that can have vitamin D, for example. Uh, uh, by the way, I don't know if this is a little, little tip, a tidbit for you. I just told you that human skin with ultraviolet radiation from the sun will make more vitamin D. But did you know that if you took just a plain old lowly white button mushroom that contains some vitamin D, if you were to, um, before you eat it, when you buy it, if you slice it, like slice it pretty thinly and you lay the, the slices out and you put it in your windowsill so your sun, the sun shines on the slice, it will make more vitamin D. Wow. You want to you actually convert more vitamin D into the, into the mushroom. So if you're going to prepare something with mushrooms, sl slice them ahead of time stick them in front of a sunny window, no matter what time of the year it is, you know, um, maybe a couple hours before you um, cook with it and the mushrooms will actually give you more vitamin D. But 
it's it's not it's a lot easier to get your regular dose of daily vitamin D um, by actually just having D three supplements. And so that's an example. Yeah. No, I love that. And and certainly what I found with my patients, like I I always adopt a food first approach, definitely. But many people these days have got as as you've already touched on super busy, stressed out lifestyles, and they're rushing around and. They either don't have time to cook a fresh whole meal. They're often buying things on the go that probably aren't the best thing for them. They've probably got high levels of stress. So actually, they're probably not even absorbing as many nutrients as they could because their digestive system isn't in the right place to absorb those nutrients. And I found sometimes, you know, a good quality supplement, like let's say a whole food, sometimes a green supplement, which has lots and lots of different phytochemicals, prebiotics, polyphenols in, it could be helpful. Uh, and sometimes it could be helpful in the short term to help them have more energy and feel better so that they can then make those lifestyle choices. So I know a lot of doctors take quite a hard line on supplements, but you've demonstrated some really important ones that I think have been shown in scientific studies have real benefits like vitamin D for sure. So yeah, I really, really appreciate and, you. You know, I want to support and underscore what you just said. You know, the, I, I, you know, there's, there's always something valuable to look at the history of things. Supplementation um, did, wasn't developed to be an online internet scam, okay? Supplementation was a really serious effort to improve global nutrition yeah. because, you know, back in even the early 20th century, most of the world was undernourished. That's different than malnutrition. I mean, maybe there was some malnutrition too, but undernutrition and undernourished means that, you know, we were eating food, but we weren't eating enough of the right things at the right time. And so one of the things that supplements were developed for to do is to really fortify, supplement, top off, you know, um, uh, everyone so that everyone could have a more equal chance of being, uh, of filling up, being coming replete with the key micronutrients that we our body needs to actually survive. And so I think it's a mistake to disparage supplements as a category. I mean, this isn't a theme of what we're talking about today. Yeah. Let's not, you know, let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater. Let's not character assassinate entire categories of things. Let's be I mean, let's let's be discerning and try to know exactly what we're talking about. There are some dietary supplements that are absolutely valuable. Some that uh, uh, that's research has actually shown, proven to be helpful, and some that are can be life saving uh, as well. Pregnant moms really need to be taking folate. You know, if you don't have those, um, you'll have neural tube defects in your babies. The, the, the risks go much higher. So you really want to be able to actually take yeah. the evidence. And so this is the other thing I think maybe a useful um, coat hook or hat hook to hang for your listeners is that supplements are the real deal because they were once designed, originally designed to help the body top off with, with what it actually needs. But if the marketing, and we're back to marketing now, sounds too good to be true, if the claims sound like they're just magical claims, that's when your um, that's when your spidey sense, your radar needs to go on. That you know maybe maybe there's something not quite uh, fully honest about what is being told about this, and it's being misrepresented. And so I think that. Every consumer needs to be able to, I mean, again, this is where I come back to, we all have mobile devices. We can easily search something. When in doubt, look it up, yeah. check it out, and then make your own decision if that if that fits your, if it fits your comfort zone. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. I used to think, you know, weight loss is just about willpower. It's about calories in, calories out. The energy balance equation is always true, but people always misinterpret it to mean that just eating fewer calories leads to body fat loss. It does not.